Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's really good to be here, isn't it? And uh, to be able to share in, uh, in worship together. I'm just going to bring the notices. Um, first of all, I just want a big thank you for everybody that helped yesterday. Uh, our open day was really well uh, received. Lots of people. I think we went from 10 o'clock till 3 o'clock. And it was so busy, the time just seemed to, to fly by. So lots of people involved. I don't want to mention names, but thank you to everyone who was involved in that. And uh, yeah, and just pray about it. You know, a lot, of, a lot of outside people came as well to see what they could, uh, you know, if they could use our, our annex for their activity, whatever they do. So yeah, let's just, just pray into that. Um, so I just, yeah, the other notices. Um, obviously, Eric's up here with me. So Eric is, is taking this morning service. And we'll be bringing God's word to us. Next Sunday, we have a visit from uh, Andy Malcolm from the Seamen's Mission, the Fisherman's Mission. So Andy's uh, been coming here for a long time. He's a great friend of our fellowship. So that's next Sunday morning. Uh, next Sunday, we also have an evening celebration and praise service. That's at half past six. So two services next Sunday. Weekly groups are on the screen, as my notes say. So thank you for putting those up. Uh, these obviously take place through the week, every week, uh, apart from when we have school holidays, so they'll be taking place this, uh, this week. Um, just a, a notice, we meet weekly in, in, in home groups, uh, but on Wednesday the 24th of May, well, um, that week we're not going to have home groups, we're going to come here and have uh, a prayer meeting. It's going to be a prayer meeting with um, some other churches that are going to come and join us. Um, it's the Thy Kingdom Come initiative. And it's about praying from, I think, from Ascension to, um, to Pentecost. But we're going to have a joint prayer meeting here. No home groups. Wednesday the 24th of May. So just make a note for your diaries. Okay. In the May half term, which is, uh, I think, a couple of weeks away... We'd like to provide some free pack lunches for families of the community that may be struggling. So we're asking for volunteers to buy and make up some loaf worths of sandwiches to bring to the church on an allocated day. If this is something you would like to get involved in more, uh, more information and, and a, a sign-up sheet are on the notice board, or come and speak to myself or Jackie Mann or Yona when he's around. So I hope this makes sense, but you know, it's something we feel as a church we could do to help the community around us. We've got no birthdays this week, so it's a, it's a quiet week in terms of birthdays, but someone has a, a wedding anniversary today, don't they Trevor? Where's Trevor? Did you remember? Good man. <laughs> Trevor and Barbara, how many years? 12, 12 years, congratulations. Okay. okay, there's a note here, it, um, Many of us uh, have been here some time, or a long time actually, will we'll know Tony Piper. Tony's uh, actually passed away, uh, so just a note here. It's, it's with mixed thoughts that sadly we have to announce the passing into glory of our brother Tony Piper, who many here will remember with fondness. Tony passed peacefully in the early hours of the morning last Sunday, 7th of May. He had been ill for some time. Please remember in your prayers Tony's wife Eileen and his two children, Karen and Andrew, alongside their families. We don't have any details of funeral arrangements at the moment, but when we do, we will, uh, we will let you know. Now, those of that uh, have known me for some time will discover that I'm a bit of a rare breed. And rare in the sense that one of my favourite areas of ministry is what I call door-to-door -door ministry. I just love working in, in communities, knocking on people's doors and hoping to introduce them to Jesus and share the gospel and ideally I don't like going uh, alone so this is a recruitment campaign this morning but it's particularly for ladies because I do like to go out male and female I think that's quite a, a good thing to do so someone's gone Whoosh. but I'm not opposed to going out with men but I've <laughs> but it's just nice to have ladies uh, with me um, so, yeah, it's just an open invitation. If you think that is something for you, do come and have a chat with me. Um, age is immaterial. The only thing is that you need to be a born-again believer and the fact that you might have to walk around and stand for some time. You know, I've known conversations on the doors can be as long as an hour. So you've got to be able to stand uh, for some time. 
Uh, experience is not uh, necessary because there will be uh, on, on the job uh, training. And he goes something like this. I'll knock on the door and say, hello, my name is Tony Smith. I'm the community chaplain at Stanway Evangelical Church and my friend would like to talk to you about Jesus. <laughs> no, I don't do that. Um, in fact, if you, if you do come, you don't have to actually say anything but to support me in prayer. But if you want to contribute, that is fine. And I've had a number, number of ladies down in Shrub End that have come out on the doors with fear and, trepidation, uh, fear and trepidation. But they've been brilliant because, particularly when you're ministering to ladies, it's good to have a lady there because they can communicate in a way that is beyond the human understanding of the average male. <laughs> OK, so do have a chat with me afterwards and it'll be great. Thank you. OK, we're going to, uh, to pray together just for a moment to ask the Lord blessing. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the day that today is. It's the Sabbath day, the Lord's day, day that you have made. And we thank you that you brought us again through a busy week full of events and activities, full of things that have taken priority in our lives. But today, you are our priority as we just lay aside all of those other things. We're here to rejoice together, to worship together, to learn together, to grow together. So we pray, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, for your blessing to be upon us as we share this uh, unique time together. We particularly are aware of all that there is to know about you as our God, your Son, as our Saviour. And as he sought to teach his disciples many things, may you today teach us new and exciting things. But we thank you that your Son taught us to pray, one of the most precious gifts that we have. And so... We join together this morning as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, we're going to read uh, again, but we're going to read this time from the New Testament, Luke's Gospel and chapter 13. So Luke's Gospel, chapter 13. And we're going to read from verse 10 of Luke's Gospel. The third of the four Gospels that we have given to us. So Luke chapter 13 and verse 10, and the scripture reads in this way. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. But the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or your donkey from the stool and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? And when he had said this, all of his opponents were humiliated. But the people were delighted with all the wonderful things that he was doing. Amen, and we trust that God will bless that word. Let's pray together uh, before we sing again. Father, we want to thank you uh, for the opportunities that you give to us each and every day to know and experience your abiding presence. It's a great source of comfort and strength to us to know that in the continuing change and cycle of life, you are a God who remains the same, that you do not change your attitude towards us never changes. Your attitude towards sin does not change in any way. 
And Father, we thank you that you are a constant presence with us, even though at times we are unaware of it. Because we do admit, quite openly admit, Father God, that there are occasions when we are not aware that you are with us as we become preoccupied with what we're doing, the things we're involved in, those things that concern us, those things that bring joy to our hearts. But we thank you, Father, that your presence isn't dependent upon our knowledge of it, but rather upon your promise that you would never leave us or forsake us. And we thank you that in your Son, the Lord Jesus, we have a Redeemer who is able to save completely and to the uttermost. A Redeemer, a Saviour who died upon a cross that our sin might be taken away, that we might become children of the living God. And thank you, Father, we thank you that because of that, we are precious in your sight. And again, we thank you for our own children here, naturally born, who are precious in our sight. We ask, Father, that you would just be with them in their various groups this morning. We pray for those who have responsibility for them week by week that they will be uh, given all that they need as they seek to teach our young people the truths relating to your word, the truths relating to your existence and that of your son, the Lord Jesus. And that you would protect them, Father, from the schemes and the trickery of Satan himself. That they will grow up to become fully your disciples and your children. We thank you, Father, was able to celebrate yesterday a new building. And we pray that it will be used for your glory and many will come to faith in Christ as a result of it. Help us to be wise in the way that it is used so that it is beneficial, not just to the community, but to the, to the life and soul and spiritual well-being of our community of Stanway. For we know that it is ever-changing, <clears throat> developing all the time. New people arriving, those we know perhaps moving away. For, Father, we do live in a constantly changing world. And we've been reminded of that fact over recent weeks and months. But we thank you that you have your hand upon us. And we pray for our government. We pray, Father, for a sense of stability within our land. That there'll be a real sense of turning away for the uncertainty and the um, disruptions that's being caused by so many. That once again, there'll be a renewed focus upon each other. And the need that we have to care for each other and to be responsible for each other. And yet there is a selfishness that prevails through this generation that Father just, well, confounds us really. And we pray that as your people we will set that good example. That there be no selfish behaviour in our actions or in our attitudes. That truly we might display the love of God to each other. And the love of God to those round about us, that as we walk around, that we might be a blessing to people, as opposed to those who would choose to avoid us. For we know, Father, that we have such an incredible message to proclaim. The gospel is good news. And there's uh, little of that these days, as we know. But we are not without hope. For our hope is built upon a firm foundation, it's built upon a rock that will not fail, a rock that will not crumble, but a rock that is steadfast and sure. For we trust in the living Christ Jesus, risen and exalted, whom all of heaven worship. We too would join with them and worship him. Sometimes, Father, our worship is weak and feeble, but the attitude of our heart is that we love you, Lord Jesus. And we want to share you with the world at large. For without the knowledge of Christ Jesus, we know the world stands condemned. We pray you'll be with Yona this morning as he preaches your word at Whitford. And that he will be inspired and encouraged by your spirit there. As we would pray for us here today. That we might hear your word clearly. That we might receive it freely. That we might be empowered to live it day by day in the knowledge that you are a faithful, unchangeable God. It's just us that change so much, for we are so fickle. Help us to be strong and steadfast, we pray. Help there to be a real commitment in our lives to do that which is right. So easy to do that which is wrong. 
And we struggle to do that which is right, but we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would empower us. For we know that nothing is impossible for you. So we pray that you will impart to us each day the grace that we need, the physical stamina, yes, of course, and the real sense of well-being, but that wonderful knowledge that you are with us. May that knowledge be very close to Andrew and Karen and their families today, that they might know your peace that passes all understanding as they come to terms with the loss of their dad, a loved one, so much. Pray for Eileen in her confused state of mind that perhaps she won't even know and understand what's happened. But nonetheless, we would pray for her and the wider family. So we pray for ourselves as well as we continue to, to worship you through song and through the receiving of your word. May you be glorified. May your presence be felt by one and all as we pray these prayers and so much more. In the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, our text, if we, uh, we really should have one, it comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 17, and it says this, For Christ did not send me to baptise, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. The emphasis being on power. Power to do what? Well, power to completely change a life. And we're going to try and unpack that a little bit this morning. Uh, about 2,600 years ago, a young man called Jeremiah was called to preach in the land of Israel at a time of national uncertainty, a time where there was great fear. Assyria ruled the land, and um, there was a lot of call for repentance because Israel was suffering through its insubordination its sinfulness, and its idolatry. And the country thought they could just push that to one side. Little did they know that the Babylonians were waiting to take over from the Assyrians that ruled the lands. And Jeremiah said this in, in chapter 13, Can an Ethiopian, there should, should be an N on the end there, by the way, so I don't need to tell me that, I've worked that out. Can an Ethiopian change his skin or a leopard, it spots. That's the question. And of course we know that that's not possible. We can't change the colour of our skin. Now we get a little bit brown if we go on holiday. And we just come back from Egypt, so we've got a little bit of a tan, which is quite nice. But realistically, we are what we are. And the leopard is always a leopard. And there's a phrase that says, a rose by any other name is what? Always a rose, isn't it? But there is a verse in the New Testament that reminds us of this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, the new creation has gone, the old has, the old has gone, the new is here. So there's almost a, a flip to the side of that coin, like a two-headed coin. No, we can't change the colour of our skin, a leopard can't change what, in other words, we are what we are, we can't just change our personality, we can't just change our character, our nature like that, because, well, it's impossible, we are what we are, and yet in the New Testament we have this wonderful hope, this wonderful promise, that the old has gone, and behold, the new has come, because of the Lord Jesus. Now, during his life here on earth, the Lord Jesus had many titles, one of which was this. Let's move that on a bit. I've gone the wrong way, haven't I? No, we're doing there. We're getting there. Right, okay. Now, one of the things that I'm not good at is singing. Another one is technology. And we'll get there in a minute. Anyway, it's supposed to be very clever, all of this. Can you put me right, Kevin, where there should be the slide where it says titles of Christ? Have a look. Okay. Many titles. Now, when the Queen was here, she had about 120 different titles to her name. And if you were to write her name out in full, you'd need several reams of paper. But the Lord Jesus has endless titles, some of which hopefully will come up on the screen. But the best of which is this. 
that Jesus is the friend of sinners. And to me, that's the greatest of all titles that were given to the Lord Jesus. He was often called the high priest, Emmanuel, God with... Oh, there we are. Thank you, Kevin. I might get it right this time. We'll see. Don't touch it. There we are. Good. Okay. So all, some of the titles are there. The chief, uh, Jesus, the friend of sinners. We'll get back on track in just a moment. Then I'm the pigs here with this, aren't I? Right. Okay. Because he has the power to change lives. Now, friendship is amazing. It's an amazing friendship. And there's something special, isn't there, about friends that we have. Now, I probably told you this before, but I grew up with not any friends, really. When I was at school, I hated school. They didn't like me very much either. Really sad. And I only ever one, had one friend at school, all the way through primary school and secondary school. A young man called Martin. And uh, we remained friends until I left school at 15. But, you know, when we think about the amazing friendship that Jesus is, it reminds us of who he is. For he is somebody without sin. Very special, very particular, very individual. And we are reminded in Scripture that the Lord Jesus was born without sin. Inherited no sin. And even when he died, it was said of him, in him there was no sin, no guile was found upon his lips. The total opposite of who we are. For we are people who are sinful. Now, we might not like being called sinners today, not very politically correct, but that's what we are. The Bible makes it clear that all have sinned, no exception, all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. There is an expectation where God glory is here we perhaps are there we just had this new building opened and it puts to shame the old because you you notice the difference the paintwork and uh, and the carpets and the flooring and, and everything else about the building through there is sparkling we've just had this redecorated in here why because it just was looking old and dowdery a bit like me really i guess but there was this this comparison between who Jesus is that he would be our friend when he is so different to us when Jesus walked on this earth there were a number of levels in society and the Pharisees and the Sadducees the religious religious leaders of the day were very careful who they mixed with lest they should contaminate themselves. And there were those that, that we might even call today the untouchables, that they, they would not want to be associated with. People who were sick, the lepers. People who were known as unclean. People who were cast as sinful people. They would steer clear of them, lest they get contaminated by them. And yet the Lord Jesus, quite the opposite, reached out his hand to shake that hand to touch that individual, to draw alongside that person. Such was the friendship that the Lord Jesus has, that nobody was excluded. And I think one of the, the hardest things to deal with is to be in a group of people and to feel excluded, to feel that you're not welcome, to feel that you're not wanted, to feel, well, I'm an outsider here. But when it comes to our relationship with the Lord Jesus, there's no fear of that. Because whoever we are, whatever we are, Jesus reaches out his hand to us all. And this morning, this morning, there is a battle going on. But the Lord Jesus wants to reach out his hand to each and every one of us. Why? Not because we are good or special, but simply because he loves us. Such is the friendship. It's quite amazing. But it's also an enduring friendship as well. Gone back, here we go. Because we said to the children right at the beginning that we live in a society where everything is constantly changing. Where things never stay the same for long. And even friendships can come and go. And it's very rare and unique if we have a friendship that covers generations, that lasts a lifetime, because they come and go, we move around, they move, we lose contact with them. And it's really hard to do that. 
But the friendship that the Lord Jesus grants to us and gives to us is a friendship that is constant. It's continuous. It never changes. It's consistent. And, you know, friendship can be quite childlike. And, and, you know, we're friends with people as long as they do what we want them to do. As long as they go along with what we want. But the moment we start to say, I don't want to do that, or I I don't want to go there, that, that friendship is at risk. And we see that very much in children. Don't we? Please don't worry. It's fine. Please don't worry. We're fine. We're fine. But we are in a battle, aren't we? And Jesus' friendship is not just enduring or unchanging, but it's unending as well. It's constant. It's always. And we said the children, he promised never to leave us or to forsake us. Such is the friendship that the Lord Jesus has with us. But it's a transforming friendship. You know, I, I, I can trace my, my life, I'm 70 years of age now, and I can relate to so many people who had an impact on our lives. On Friday, we went out for dinner, went to the ship at Tiptree. I'm not paid for doing this, but it was really a good place to go to. And we went with some friends of ours that I've known for 55 years. And when I became a Christian age 15, Brian, as he's known, his wife Margaret, they weren't married then, but Brian took me under his wing from day one of me becoming a Christian. And I owe him so much because my family wasn't a nice family, but they took me into their home. He supported me. He encouraged me. He's remained that friend all that time. But we haven't seen each other for four years, five years, perhaps. Not because of any reason. It's just how life is sometimes. But the moment we got together, it's like that friendship had never been apart. Constant, consistent. And that's the friendship that Jesus gives to us. And Brian transformed or helped to transform my life when I became a Christian. He included me in his family. included me in the things that he did in his church. And it was just incredible. To be included in that friendship is really special, isn't it? Uh, And sometimes friendship groups can become very exclusive. And we're not allowed in. Well, you're not part of our group. And that's very childlike, isn't it? And we see it at school where you've got children in, in little groups. And there's somebody on the outside waiting to get in. You know, the Bible tells us that whoever comes to the Lord Jesus, he will never, ever turn himself or us away but we want to think also this morning about how that friendship impacts upon a life a life of a of a woman what there we go we there there we go who found herself struggling and we read in luke 13 how the lord jesus was was teaching in a synagogue on the sabbath day and there was a lady there who was bent over bent double a spine was deformed and she was almost from what we understand from the scripture almost bent so she was touching her toes and the lord jesus reached out to her because there were two things that he recognized he recognized that she was helpless couldn't help herself, couldn't correct herself, couldn't put herself right. You know, sometimes we say, I've got to give myself a good talking to here. I've got to get over this, I've got to get through this. But sometimes it's not that easy. There are times when we just need that extra support, that extra bit of help and encouragement. And this woman was helpless to do anything about what she could. She'd been like it, the Bible says, for 18 years. And the chances are she would have talked to all sorts of people, saw all sorts of help, and still there was none that could help her. Have we ever had a a, a niggling ache or pain? And we go to the doctors and and they say, well, take these pills. But it still remains. And we think, well, I went to the doctor and he didn't do any good. I still feel the same. And that's exactly how this woman was feeling. Helpless. But not only helpless, her position was hopeless as well. Because actually, there we go. Actually, she was without hope. There was nobody that could help her 
now, in the past, or in the future. Medically, there was nothing anybody could do. So she was lost in all of her illness, in her deformity, in her inability to help herself. And sometimes we, we feel a bit like that, weighed down by our sin, weighed down by the circumstances of life, weighed down by the, the pressures that are being put upon us. And we think, who is there that can help me? I've, I've reached out to people. The situation is hopeless and helpless. And I guess we've all been in that plight sometimes. You know, I've really struggled this week and probably struggling a bit this morning as well. And we just need that friend to help us through. So we find she was in this awful position, way down, because she couldn't help herself. But then we notice the power by which she was freed. Wonderful. In verses 12 and 13. Because we have here a demonstration of God's power. Now, I was very uh, privileged when I was a young man. Um, I was the hitchhiker lift because I couldn't get anywhere without it. I lived right in the sticks and what have you. But some guy stopped and gave me a lift in an E-type Jaguar. And that's my favourite car. It remains my favourite car. I couldn't get in one now. If I got in, I wouldn't get out. That's the trouble. But he said... Let me show you what it can do. And we were going along this road where I lived and he just put his foot down. It was like being in a jet aircraft. The thing just took off. And he was overtaking cars that were frightening the life out of me. But he said, can you feel the power of the car? And he demonstrated that to me. And uh, this friend that I spoke about who helped me in being Christian bought me a little mobilette. Um, moped thing and it was it was crazy really because I used to I used to go into work on it sometimes and there'd be a guy cycling along when we went downhill I overtook him but when we went uphill he overtook me and it was so embarrassing because it had no power even though it gave all the sort of indications that it was. And in the end, it just died a death. But we have this, this example where the Lord Jesus calls this woman out. She doesn't come to him. He calls her. He identifies her need. And Christ does that, identifies our need. Calls her out and just touched her and set her free. Just spoke to the woman laid his hand upon her and her life was changed and transformed. And that's what happens. That's what happens when Jesus touches our lives. He transforms it. He releases us. It could well be a habit that we've got that we just cannot get break, get rid of it. It, it could be just an attitude that we have. It could be a hurt that we're carrying that's rooted within us. And as much as we try, we just cannot free ourselves from it. I get so cross when that happens. And there's things in my life that I wish I could deal with. And I just want, want to be released from it. And that's what this woman wanted. She just needed to be released. And the power of Christ was that power. As he came and as he demonstrated that power, not just through this woman, but by those he met, healed the lepers, gave the blind their sight, raised the dead, transforming people's lives. All who came to him, the Bible said, were healed. Isn't that incredible? Jesus demonstrating his power to change lives. We have a saviour who can do that. Because that was the purpose he came into this world. He came to bring freedom. To bring release for the captive. To set straight the pathway. The Lord Jesus came to die upon a cross. Jackson's lovely, isn't he, Liz? Yeah. So gorgeous. You could eat him, couldn't you? But you're not allowed to, by the way. But the Lord Jesus came with a purpose in mind. His purpose was to die upon a cross so that our sin could be dealt with. Because without that, we're in that position of that woman where we're helpless and hopeless. But the Lord Jesus, when he died upon that cross, God's punishment was put upon him and our sin was dealt with. 
And when we come to Christ, we are set free as that woman was set free and her body was made straight. And we're no longer called those who are sinful, but we are called those who are sinless. Because of Christ's power and ability to do that. And can he do it for us today as he did it for that woman? Of course he can. Why? Because he's the same yesterday, today and forever. He never changes. His purpose never changes. His power never wanes. Never does it rescind in any way whatsoever. So whatever we're carrying, whatever hurt we have, whatever pain we've got, whatever habit we can't get rid of, whatever thoughts we might have, Give it to Christ. And he has the power and the willingness to transform our lives because he has that transforming friendship. But notice also, oh, I keep doing that, don't I? There we are. Notice also the praise which she was filled with. Yesterday, I was home alone. Well, I was up here quite a bit of the time. But basically, I was home alone because my wife... It was very nice, by the way. Went to London with two of our eldest daughters and our eldest granddaughter. And the reason they went to London wasn't because they missed the coronation. wasn't because they wanted to go and see some museum or monument. They went to London, well, for one thing in purpose, to go shopping. And they did. Very successfully, I have to say. And when they got off the train last night at 11 o'clock at Colchester Station, our eldest granddaughter showed me all what she had bought. We stood outside in the car park and she was so excited. Look at this, Grandpa. And I'm saying, oh, it's a bit short. Yeah, oh, yeah you need to put lead weights in that skirt to hold it down a bit. You know? and, that, and then she brought out these trainers that she got. And it was, they were just amazing. And she was so excited. She couldn't wait to show me what she'd got. And I was able to share in that joy. It was wonderful. And do you know what was even more amazing? Judy didn't spend a penny yesterday. <laughs> Miracles happen. Incredible. Well, she bought, bought lunch, but there we are. But this woman was so excited about what God had done in her life that she sang his praises. But, you know, that really brings it into conflict because actually when, when we are, are touched by God, then some can be resentful of it. Some can be jealous of it. And, and we find this woman being accused by the religious leaders of the day, why are you getting healed on the Sabbath? Come back tomorrow. It's, a, a, it's not the Sabbath. Come back Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but don't come back on the Sabbath. They resented the work of Christ. And we're negative about it. And actually we're a barrier to people coming to faith in Jesus. And we find that today. You know, there's a, there is a resentment, there is a hostility towards the gospel. When we talk about the Lord Jesus, straight away a barrier comes up. Talk about God. People are very happy to talk about God. Talk about the Lord Jesus and, and, and a barrier comes up. Because actually when we talk about the Lord Jesus, it demands a response. For we either recognize him as the son of God and respond accordingly, or we deny that and suffer the consequences of that. But they resented the fact that this woman was set free. They'd rather she stayed as she was. How awful is that? That that should be the case. But there were others who rejoiced as well. Because she was filled with praise. She praised God because she was set free and was liberated. And, you know, we too can share that joy, can't we? Last Sunday night, what happened here last Sunday night? We had a baptismal service. I wasn't here, but that's not the point. And why were we here to witness the baptism? Because we wanted to share the joy that Elle had to come into faith in Jesus. And she demonstrated that by going through the wars of baptism. What a privilege it is to share that joy. And the scripture tells us that there is rejoicing in heaven. Rejoice in heaven itself over one sinner who comes to repentance. Because it's coming into life. And the old life has gone. 
We ask the question, don't we? Can a leopard change its spots? Can we change the colour of our skin? Can we change who we are? Is it possible then to become born again, to become a, a new person, to be freed from sin? And the Old Testament would lend us to say, well, actually, the heart is deceitful above all things. And the Bible says that if we say we're out of sin, we deceive ourselves. And we can pretend that we're okay and that we're on the right track and we don't hurt anybody, we don't harm anybody, we do good things. But actually, whatever we do is never good enough because sin, that thing which we're born with, which we've inherited, you know, Jackson, you wouldn't think butter would melt in his mouth. But he lets you know when he's not happy, doesn't he? Yeah. Where does that come from? We don't teach our children to be wrong. We don't teach our children to be naughty, do we? You're not Lucy, are you? You're Anna, aren't you? Yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah. I just get carried away, that's all. Yeah. And you've got Isaac. Yeah, him as well. Yeah, yeah. And Eli's just as bad as, as Jackson, isn't he? Yeah, he is. But you never told him to be bad. You never told him to scream and shout and to lose his temper. It's, it's there, isn't it? And that's the, the, the result of sin in our life. Let us not be deceived this morning. That we need to be changed. We need to be transformed. Can a leopard change its spots? Well, physically, it's impossible. Can we change our attitudes? Well, physically, humanly, it's impossible. But spiritually, we can. Because there is power in the cross to change our lives. And I think I better finish there because I've messed it up, haven't I? There we are. There we go. And we're finished with that. That's this phrase. Christ's power to completely change your life. So if nothing else I've said this morning makes sense, if you're thinking, oh, for goodness sake, Eric, go home. Which I will do, I promise. Just hang on to that great truth that there is power in the cross. There is power in the gospel to change our lives. Not just in a little bit, but power to change it completely. I've always said that nothing changes your life like having a baby. And I should know because I've had four. And that's true. I have had four. But what I mean is, everything changes, doesn't it? But nothing changes your, our lives like coming to know Jesus as saviour. Because the transformation is complete and total and it's everlasting. Our children will grow up and they'll believe and they'll make their own families in their own way. And our life will go back to some sort of normality. It will go back to what it was. But when we come to Christ, our lives are never the same again. Let's rejoice today in the salvation that we have in Jesus. Let's rejoice in the new life that we have in Christ. Let's rejoice today that the Lord Jesus is that amazing friend, that enduring friend, that everlasting friend who saved us, redeemed us, and has transformed us. And one day we shall be with him forever in glory. Amen? Amen. Okay, I'm going to get this bit right because the musicians are going to come and sing now and lead us in our final song. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the son of the living God. And as a result, you have the power and the willingness to change hearts and lives. Change them for better. Change them for all of eternity. And we pray today, Father God, that all of us just need to grasp and understand that when you change a life, you transform it completely. May we rejoice in that. May we share each other's joy as we celebrate the fact that Jesus is Saviour and Lord. Father, we pray that we might daily see demonstrations of his power as we have battles to face. But may we know that victory that surpasses all else, victory over sin and death itself, as we rejoice and worship together for all glory, all honour and all power belongs to you, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. So, Father, thank you for the time we shared together today. Just Take hold of the muddled words and use them for your glory. We pray that you'll take us to our homes in safety, that we might know peace beyond measure, that we might have sufficient grace for each need, and we will have power to overcome all obstacles 
for you are our God and we are your children. In our Saviour's name we pray. Amen.